Hi, and welcome to this episode of the Levin Podcast. It's been a while. Um, I just want to say that out loud. It's been a while. I think it's been almost a year since our last one. Molly, you and I will have to talk about that one later. Um, But as with me always is Molly. Um, Hello, Molly. How are you? Hello, I'm good. And today we're joined by Dr. Roby Simons. Dr. Simons, will you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I'm a professor of real estate and urban planning here at Levin. Been here since 1990, so I'm entering my 31st year on board here at our wonderful college. And uh, about six months ago, I became chair of the department, so I'm having all that administrative fun. So I'm, I'm enjoying the challenges, and at the same time, I'm still doing some research on some transportation mobility innovations that we're going to talk about today. Awesome, awesome. Um, I would also let to know, let people know who are on Spotify. We are still doing this on Zoom and being extra careful because of COVID. Um, CSU is still, you know, operating remotely, and so this is done with one hundred percent COVID allowed restrictions and all that fun stuff. So don't COVID safe. Care. COVID safe. Um, I, that's how everyone is starting things. Is this is done one hundred percent COVID safe? So. I didn't bring uh, my mask, but I guess that's okay. <laughs> Wait a minute, maybe I have a little pocket. I want to see I, you. I think I have like 10 masks somewhere in my general vicinity. Um, all right, so let's start with this study. Tell me a little bit about the study, what brought this on, all that fun stuff. Well, we have a guy in a college called Andy Thomas who does energy policy. And about a year and a half ago, he said, uh, been working with this group down in uh, Canton. They're called SARTA. It's the uh, Stark Area Regional Transport Authority, and they're good to work with. And you may get a call from a guy about a grant. So we worked this grant up, and uh, this is part of the Federal Transportation Authority Integrated Mobility Innovations Program, IMI. So basically, the grant uh, started last June. It's three years, 250,000 bucks total over that time period. And we have a staff of uh, a staffer, Mark Henning, and some students like Abby Posky and Malcolm Trier, and some colleagues like Tom Hildy and myself and one or two others, including some of our other partners. And we're going to research pretty much the implementation of a, a payment system called Easy Fare on uh, people's mobility, basically the rider's mobility. That's the, the main thrust of the research to see if having this transportation debit card basically will increase mobility and help people get to work, to get shopping, to get to me- medical and worship and social things and all the things that people need to have a better quality of life. So our job is to kind of gauge the effect of this new technique of paying on, uh, on mobility. Now, what's interesting is this is a touchless payment system. So you basically go, you get a debit card, you load money on it, and then you spend the money down. And then as you appear on a bus, there's a new device called the validator, and you basically touch or expose your card to the validator and it chirps you. You don't need a receipt. You don't have to talk to the driver. The driver doesn't have to slow down and deal with you. And you know it stops where there's 15 people getting on the bus. That can be a big deal for the way the how efficiently the, the system moves. And that's somebody else's study. We're really looking how it affects mobility. So that's the main thing. And uh, the thing we're looking at right now, and I'm going to talk about today, is uh, we have a four a f- four or five waves of surveys. We've identified about. 1,200 people so far. I'm going to report on about 1,100 of them. We're going to have another four or 500. So we'll have about 1,600 in the survey, of which around seven or 800 probably using this system in its early form. And we're going to track them over two and a half years, basically every six months, to see how their mobility patterns are changing. So we're asking where they're going and who they are and some other things about uh, their behavior and how they feel about things. And we're just starting now. So in order to get a good baseline, on uh, the study, because any study you're going to have a before and after period, and you have a case group which is using Easy Fair and a control group which is not. So for the before period, we launched just right in the middle of COVID. So that's a bad time to have kind of a nice vanilla baseline. So we had to have a, a, a double baseline. We asked them, what'd you do last week? Tell us about your travel patterns. And then we asked them, what'd you do March 1st, the week before COVID hit? So that's the focus of our paper. We have a nice COVID, the transportation and COVID paper. It's not really about easy fare quite yet because we haven't implemented any of the technology to its full extent. So 
So that's coming down the road. Those uh, validators are getting installed. A couple of the 12 transit agency partners or 11 partners rather have those installed already, but only two of them. And so by the time say June rolls around, most of them should have it. So that's when we'll go in for a second wave. So that's kind of the background. What is the system right now look like? Well, we have 11 transit partners. The ones furthest along say would be Lake Tran, which is in Lake County, uh, Painesville area. Uh, they've got validators already installed and they're running a suburban bus system. And then some of the other agencies at the other end of the spectrum might be the Warren Area Transportation Authority, which isn't even charging fares and they're waiting for their validators to be installed in the future. Okay. Um, so who's, how, so you're doing multiple regions. How many are in the region? Like how many regions and then who are they? So we have the biggest ones are Cincinnati, Akron, and Canton. Those are the bigger of the three. Now, uh, Cincinnati is obviously the largest. We've also got Butler County. We got Medina, Sandusky, um, and two or three others that we haven't started yet. So you've got a good mix of places from around the state. Yeah, got a good um, mix. I have a couple rural systems, a number of small metros, and then a, one large metro. And and you didn't set out in, in planning this for it to be COVID related, um, right? That just that was just happenstance. Just happened. But. Um, has the trans have the transit authorities or or the, the the federal transit administration come back to you um with you know questions about you know hey this really <laughs> this this is an opportunity given covid um to expand this to other other transit systems and have you know integrated that thinking into this study well that's sort of the idea of doing the study we'd like to be able to do a pilot where we can demonstrate the benefits to the riders from having the system the de transportation debit card. And uh, that's the purpose of it. But it's, it's going to take a couple of years to work that up. Yeah, COVID just kind of happened and uh, nobody wanted it. It delayed the start. And look, the transit agency's riderships are down, you know, 50% mm -hmm. or so, usually usually decreased. And matter of fact, our riders are showing that before and after COVID, their, their ridership is down about a third. So we have a kind of transportation dependent subgroup here. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so you, you're, you're looking at people who are um, more reliant yes. on, on public we, transit. Regardless, is that regardless of where they are in the state or is that by particular um, regions or transit authorities? Well, based on the, we, we, sur we surveyed Lake Tran, Metro Akron, Metro Canton and Cincinnati so far. So out of those, we've got about, uh, 38% African-American, just a few percent Hispanic, 43% uh, with incomes below 20,000. That's clearly a lower income group. Uh, renters about 58% uh, are renting, typically be about 63% owning. So we have more renters, more people under 20,000. And we also interestingly have about 18% unbanked people. That means people that don't have any bank accounts. They might be on, uh, disability or something might have a credit card that's loaded with money from the government. They don't actually have a, a bank account. So we're looking at that vulnerable population and they're the focus of our study. So we've done a good job being able to reach them in our survey. And let me tell you, surprisingly, they're very, very uh, internet uh, connected. 92% of our people have internet connections. We have, we're doing a very few of these over the phone. It'd be about 50 to 80 out of the, the total sample. It's quite, uh, quite amazing what you can do on the internet these days. I thought we'd have to be a lot more calling and, and then people in person, but, and but we did a couple of surveys in person under the COVID restriction. Don't go there. <laughs> Not happening. Too much. Uh, I was going to ask, so when you, with, with the easy fare and this debit card, do they load it? Would it be online or are there kiosks like available? Cause I know when I lived in New York, I would once a month go get like a unlimited pass and I had like that pass that I could ride around. Um, and I'm assuming that this is going to be similar to that, but not quite right. Cause it's like, I got like a, that bendy ticket and I saved some for some, you know, emotional connection to them. But like, I would go get it from the kiosk once a month 
and just use that one card. So with the debit card, is it, could you, do you have to have internet access or could you go to like a kiosk and get it? Like they, they have different ways you can get in the game. Uh, you have a card that's assigned to you, but it doesn't have a face ID, which means you could hand it to your friend and they could burn off the stored value on it. But you, you can go load it. Once you have it loaded, you can recharge on the internet. You can always discharge when you're actually riding an Uber or a, uh, a bus or a paratransit, as long as there is one of the partners and there are other partners that are being added. Move It is an app and Transit App is an app. Those are also integrated into the mobility picture here. And a person can use the same card in Canton or Lake Tran or, or in uh, you know, Metro in Akron. So those, those, there's a lot of advantages there. Uh, but there's different ways you can get in. Once you have it, you can reload on the internet. And okay. uh, they're up in their game in terms of making it easy to load money on. But the people never had it so far, and they, and they don't have the validators yet. But it's, it's you know, 80, 90% say easier to buy and easier to get on and faster. So, so that's like it, even though it doesn't really have any features yet. That's in terms of ease of use, right? And you talked yeah. about other people potentially looking at efficiency, moving people along yes. transit routes faster. Um, but in terms of uh, advancing their mobility and their mobility options, um, what do you hope to find? What would you expect to find that uh, where they're going, distance traveled changes, um, you know, how does it change that dynamic of um, populations of people being able to access goods and services in their community with increased mobility? Right, well, you have to think of, of trip by uh, destination type. So the, the main things like the essential trips are shopping and work. So if you don't have that, you don't have you know, the basics. Then you've got things at the other end of the spectrum like uh, recreational, social, or, or worship. Those, those tend to be more uh, discretionary and those trips are dropping right now quickly. But we're seeing, for example, drops in trip, and this is not attributable to the easy for COVID, that the essential trips are dropping by maybe 11 to 19% between say, just before COVID and say uh, four or five months, say let's say that would be December 1st as an average date there. So they're, go they're down, but they're not down hugely. The discretionary trips are down 50%, usually down, some even more. And in, in the middle, you've got things like personal business and school, et cetera. Those things are down somewhere, you know, 30, 40%. What we'd hope to find is that using easy fare over a long run, over uh, a year or two, say, that people would have more access to all the trips. One thing I'm finding a little disturbing is the medical trips tend to be that, that I would think medical trip would be a, uh, an, an essential trip, but people seem to be uh, dropping that more than I would expect. So maybe, you know, they're, they're compromising their health a little bit. Well, and so that's, the, that's a question I would, I would have, um, right now in the time period we're in related to, uh, you know, maybe vaccination, right, for COVID. You're talking about um, people who are potentially essential workers, also um, people who may be higher on the list um, for uh, vaccination priority and- um, Or maybe uh, lower. Or maybe lower. And they're young, then they're probably not on any list. They're not on the one A or one B list, according to Ohio yet, so. Are, are you planning on asking questions related to, um, to accessing uh, vaccinations? That's been uh, a significant question in many communities about um, where these clinics are located, people's access to them, how they will get there if they are vulnerable populations or in, um, in places without pharmacies or institutions of health. Right. So we, we are aware of the institutions of health, hospitals and clinics. We have that in our database. Um, we're not asking about vaccinations. One of the reasons you got HIPAA and other rules about asking medical questions. And we've kind of steered clear of those. All this has been cleared by the Cleveland State University IRB, the Institutional Board, Review Board that deals with questions. And if you start asking personal medical questions, the red flags go up, breaks go on, and the whole group convenes and, you know, it's, uh, it's like talking to children or, or you know, 
people that can't see that are pregnant, uh, you know, mm -hmm. that are dependent uh, and, and speak another language. So you, you kind of want to mm -hmm. keep it in those. So we probably won't get to that, although it's a great question, certainly an equity question. Mm -hmm. But that's right, not what we'll probably get to. I was going to say, I could see people using like public transportation more once the vaccines start opening up and wanting to have that access to public transportation to get to the location to do vaccines. Um, so that would be interesting if you find that in the future is, is the ridership goes up once the, the um, phases open up to almost everybody. Right. Well, we, we hope that at some point, uh, maybe the, the card itself could be stocked with value as a form of transportation subsidy. Mm -hmm. And also that people would have a shorter commuting time or shorter time, more reliable uh, travel pattern that could, uh, you know, the, the, the gap between planning and, and doing would be uh, reduced. So that's, that brings you to sort of where this research could ultimately go mm -hmm. and, and be used. So what are some, outside of what you've just already outlined, other, the other policy implications for, for transportation and planning around transportation for communities. Because you're talking about, um, you know, different levels of need and, and, and by place and region, right? You talked about having rural and very urban places in this study. So are, are those policy implications and potential recommendations different? Sure. By place, uh, what could some of those be, and and you know what are the long terms for um, public transit authorities nationally for using um, these kinds of sort of mobility incentives? Right, it's not just the incentives. That the card's only as good as it partners. For example, this is just a bus card. That's not as good as if you can use it on Uber, paratransit. If you can rent a scooter, if you can plan your trip. So one of the main things, and there's a group called Neoride that's sort of the uh, organizing entity for all these transit partners. And their job is to get other transportation providers, the paratransit, the Ubers, the Lime or the Bird for the scooters, uh, Move It, Transit App, and of course all the bus systems, get them all up into the game and make sure that the card is universally accepted. So the more multimodal it is, the higher impact you'll have. Because people have, still an issue with uh, kind of being in a transit desert, some of them. They have the, what's called the first mile, last mile problem. So if you can use integrated modes, for example, let's say you got a good bus ride. If you want to get to work, walk 10 minutes, take a bus, wait, take another bus, walk five minutes. It could be an hour to get there. And it might be a way to, to with, with the same card, you can use an Uber and cut that to 40 minutes by uh, you know using a, a short Uber or you can rent a scooter or something like that. So the intermodal side, that, that really depends. And we're still bringing the transit partners on, on board. Uh, there's a couple other consultants. Masabi is one that's running, uh, they're running all the inside data for the validators, which is the easy fare card. And then there's CalStart, which is coordinating all the data for all the various vendors. And there's lots of data coming in and have to sign all these agreements. But to the extent that we have all the data available, and we have good integrated mobility, then we can generalize to other transit areas. So it's not just buses. You know, in, in America, about 85% of all the trips are taken in cars and about 11% in buses and the remaining few percent are taken, you know, in other ways. In our sample here, it's more like 50% on buses. And it's the main mm -hmm. source because of the population we're dealing with. I mean, I can think- that sample. I was gonna say, I could think of like, you know, especially with like tourism, if you are going to be doing like weekend trips to Columbus or Cincinnati, or even just, you know, going somewhere and buying, being able to have this debit card and just use it there for public transportation, that would help out with just, you know, getting around a city easily. Cause I know a lot of people get confused when they go to another city and trying to figure out how to buy I did this. That's why I say I know a lot of people. It's, it was me who got confused going to another city and being like, <laughs> I had a friend um, going to another city and being like, okay, so how do I, you know, get around? And sometimes you want to take an Uber and sometimes you hop on a bus or a train and stuff like that. So do you see that this could be like something that could go nationwide and 
and almost be like a nationwide debit card for public transportation? That would be a great outcome, maybe in 10 years. But I think, again, that's sort of a, people that are mobile enough to go on vacation is sort of a different population than the ones we're right. talking about. We're dealing with the people, again, half of them have incomes under 20,000. Right. So, so are there any places that are doing this well? This that are address uh, mobility, the multimodal mobility related transit for this, these types of populations where you're looking at lower income, lower access, um, you know, who need public transportation for, uh, you know, all modes of travel, whether it be to work, doctor, recreation, school. Yeah, not, not as well as we need it. I mean, uh, there, there's some, it's about, the literature is about five years old on, the, on using the, uh, the integrated mobility stuff. It's been done in other countries. Israel, for example, has a Ravkov card, which is, a, it's got move it on it and you can uh, plan trips, you can pay for your bus fare and you can pay for train fare with this one app and you can load money on it. It's got your picture. It has an internal receipt. It's, it's touchless. So it's been out there for a few years. I'm not familiar in the US. I know they're, they're just starting to have the system. Uh, and some of the machines are coming from overseas. So it's not uh, gotten to the point where it's being manufactured in the US. Seems, it still seems like it's a little on the early side. And again, even if you have the hardware and the software for the uh, card itself, the hardware being the validators to record where, it's, where you actually take the trip, uh, only a few areas in the country have implemented it. And again, they don't have the Uber bus, uh, you know, cross locational mm -hmm. feature. So it's really still evolving. Has great potential, but right now, uh, just in the nascent uh, kind of exploratory early implementation phase. All right, all right. Um, at this point, is there anything, any final words you'd like to say about the study? I know that you had some charts. Mother thinks the report. Yeah, don't worry about the charts. I, I'll show you a chart. Actually, we got one. Okay, let's let's see a chart. I I always like the visual aids. That I'm a visual learner myself. <laughs> this is from some current research we're doing. Okay. So this is the where the uh, types of modes are dropping. You can see walking going down a lot and uh, some of the other modes. Rideshare also has been affected. But we have data on, on at a pretty granular level. And I, I don't mm -hmm. want to go over all these, but this is a, an example of the type of data we have. We know uh, destination by mode and where the drops are. And so we'll be able to unpack that a little bit too. So the so other, it's, the other it's, thing I want to tell you, we, we've done some regression analysis. It's a, a sophisticated type of statistic where we look at, uh, you know, relationships, not just descriptive statistics, but try to explain who's really concerned about what. For example, we, we, we asked the question, who's really traveling less between COVID and you know, between, before COVID and during COVID. And we found that basically females, uh, African-Americans, especially if they're married or have kids at home with incomes over 85,000 and areas that have reported high COVID infection rates, those are the people that are reducing their traveling a lot. And surprisingly, if you don't have a bank account or if you're working, even if you're self-employed, those people don't have decreased trips to the same extent. And we also asked two other questions. We asked, uh, are you feeling less connected to your community? And, uh, you know, transport's all about connection. So we found there that uh, people that uh, felt less connected with females, those with a driver's license and with kids felt less connected. And unbanked people didn't have that drop in feeling connected, which I surprised me a little bit. Well, they and have to be, they have to be connected. Yeah, I was gonna say they have to be connected. Right, would you, would you potentially uh, think that maybe that is an indication that um, if at any point they become uh, not even just feel disconnected, but actively disconnected from their community, that's a disconnection to uh, their livelihood and uh, you know, their, their ability to uh, stay afloat, in, especially in a situation you know like this, and so they may be people who uh, have no choice and and aren't. We have, we have over a hundred 
to 150 unbanked people in our survey. So we're getting to, we have some, some real numbers of folks. Yeah. Uh, one other area we looked at, we asked who was afraid of catching COVID. And uh, it wasn't really uh, that clear, but if you were to be afraid, it was people that were uh, African-American having kids and being married. And if you had, if you were employed or if you had a driver's license, the odds of being afraid were small. So that summarizes where we are to date. So will you be able to tell um, in, not, not in real time, but uh, close to, because you're surveying so frequently, um, as people's attitudes potentially change and they travel more? Absolutely. So are you going to ask this fear? Are you going to continue to ask this question related to fear of catching COVID and o over time? Yes. Or, or was that a single point in time in this study? We're not going to ask more what you do pre-COVID. We'll have collected that information. Next time we go, we'll ask what they did last week, the week before the survey, and compare that to the, the, the previous last week, which would be you know December of 2020. And we will continue to ask about fear of COVID. And we're going to ask a couple other questions we kind of missed on like if you're self-employed and a few other things, maybe with more about where they live and something maybe about travel time in generic terms to see about satisfaction. So when you started the study, it was pre-COVID with the idea that, you know, a pandemic wasn't going to hit, but it ended up that the study has a pandemic in it. Do you think that it's going to make this study uh, more relevant or more so um, impactful because you're seeing what a pandemic is doing to ridership and you're seeing the need, like everyone who's riding needs to ride public transportation. And we're seeing that now because the people who don't have to ride are not, but we're seeing people who have to ride, ride and that this might benefit them more. And we're seeing that more because we're in the middle of a pandemic versus before the pandemic. Yeah, the pandemic has turned the whole thing upside down. I mean, it's like doing a study of, uh, let's say you're, you're on a ship and uh, you're gonna serve people dinner. So you, you think about them coming from their, their uh, you know, their, their resident rooms to the, to the dining room and the waiters are in the kitchen and you're gonna be bringing them food and you know, asking them about things and it's gonna be pretty detailed and relaxed. And then all of a sudden the ship is tossing and turning like this and going this way and that way and, and they don't have to pay for dinner instead of paying for it. And, uh, you know, every possible disruption. And then you ask, how do you feel about that? <laughs> but it's a little bit more dire, right? It's a little bit more like... Plus the transit agencies are in financial mm -hmm. stress. Mm -hmm. uh, ridership's, you know, gone down 50%. Uh, everything's topsy-turvy. But uh, it just makes it more interesting to research. Right. Right. Well, and and the potential to, you know, to say that um, public transit could uh, serve a more vital role in communities related to economic recovery post pandemic. Right. Absolutely. And I think it, it'll probably increase the case for keeping funding for uh, public transit agencies around. It's under a lot of pressure at the state level and even at the federal, I believe. Because every possible public sector service is under tremendous stress, especially anything funded with income tax. Right. And I, I wonder if there'll be more ridership after the pandemic because of the, the economy that we're in right now. We might see more people having to take public transportation. You know. But you could also say that people that were commuting to work are now working from home. That's true. So there's a lot of things going on, both of what you mentioned, probably what I said, there's other things as well. So I think it's a, it's a, brave, a brave new world out there. Right, and we'll they, see who- They change the types of routes that are offered and popular. But at the end of the day, I think it's about integrated mobility, mm -hmm. making it easier to pay and being able to mm -hmm. use that same car to jump on an Uber, especially if it's raining for your last trip and be, maybe sh be sure you can get from home to where you're going and back, uh, you know in a better way and faster and take those trips. Yeah. More trips are better. For sure. Well, it's, it's good to hear that the college is involved in research like this and with um, partners from across the state. Um, I think that Kristen and I would be uh, you know, interested when you're closer to the end of the study 
and have a lot more data to share to um, see what we find and uh, maybe in the uh, post pandemic period, see how um, the dynamics of, of this integrated mobility have shifted. Sounds great. Let's hope we get to that post pandemic period ever if we do, but sooner than rather than later. Here's to hoping. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Simons. This has been absolutely amazing. I, you know, I'm very fond of public transportation and it's, you know, I hopefully will go forward into an easier way of, of riding public transportation. Okay. Maybe easy fares for you. Easy fare. Absolutely. As you know, I, I get the student pass every, every semester. So, all right. Well, thank you so much. And until next time. Um, everyone stay safe, right? Stay safe, stay healthy. Hope to see everybody in class. Yes, I hope to see everyone in class. I can't wait for that day. Thank you guys so much. Bye. Be well, be safe. Be safe. <laughs>